I think it's about time, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So, hello everyone, my name is Alex, and I'm gonna give you a walking tour of WASM tools. Sorry, that was the best alliteration I could, I could come up with. So, first off, what in the world is WASM tools? This is a CLI and a suite of low-level libraries for manipulation of WASM modules. This is a open source repository in the Bytecode Alliance. It, uh, we accept many contributions from anyone who's interested in adding various subcommands to things. And the idea here is that there is a lot of functionality baked into a single command called WASM tools. This has lots of subcommands internally to explore a WASM module and see some functionality within it. This is very similar to other projects such as Wabbit or the WASM binary toolkit or Binarian. Not the compilation side of Binarian, but more the tooling and converting between text and things like that. The major part of WASM tools as well is that this is the underpinnings of the WASM time runtime itself. So the binary decoder, the binary translation, binary reading, a lot of testing. I'll be going over a lot of those in this talk and giving you a demo of how all this is working. But so the, the intention here is that all this is intended to be used in WASM time and in theory production ready in that regard as well. So this is where we come to the other walking part where I'm gonna do a little, a little less walking, a little more typing. So I get to show everyone my typing prowess here in a browser or a terminal. All right, so let's say we wanna explore a WASM file. So first off, we're gonna start with some Rust code. So uh, we have this Rust code and we wanna compile it to WASM. So we'll say hello.rs, we'll pass it a target for WASM32 WASP1, if I can type it correctly. This pops out a hello.wasm. As you might expect, we can run this inside of a runtime like WASM time and it prints out the message that we expect. But what we're curious about here is what in the world is inside this, hello, is inside this module? So some of you might be wondering, what in the world am I doing right here? Well, this is the actual contents of this module, although it's binary. This is not actually that intelligible. This is just a lot of stuff going on there. We can take a look at the actual hex bytes themselves and we can see that, okay, we've got some binary bytes. We've also got some ASCII bytes, but again, this is the binary format for WebAssembly. We're not really intended to read this. So this is where WASM tools comes in. So we have a suite of uh, subcommands here we can take a look at, but let's take a look at this print subcommand and kind of see what's going on there. So we can print this, this module. That was a lot of text that just flew by the screen all at once. So there's a lot going on here, so let's just redirect this out to a file, and then we can take a look at the file itself. This is the structure of a WASM module internally, which is the actual text form of the binary format. So this is all corresponding to those bytes we were seeing. We see lots of stuff about WASM here. So the text format loves to use parentheses. We've got WASM things like types, imports, tables, globals, and we got functions here, instructions. We can kind of scroll down. There's a lot of stuff here in this WASM module. But coming down here to the bottom, my editor's a little bit slow, but we have all these kind of big binary blobs here going on. This is what we were seeing at the end there. This is the data sections and custom sections. And specifically, we've got some debug info here, which was kind of large. But in any case, this is sort of uh, taking a look at the outside of a WASM module, looking inside of it, and kind of seeing what's internally. The next thing we can kind of take a look at, though, is perhaps this validate subcommand. This is where a random blob of bytes is not necessarily valid WASM binaries. You have to actually have a validation predicate on it. So if we took a look, take a look at WASM tools validate, it has a couple of options, but we're mostly just gonna pass an input and we'll take a look at some feature flags, for example. So if we validate this hello.wasm, Nothing happened. But it turns out, uh, this, well, if I, I'm gonna run that one more time, whoop, I can't really actually type very well right here. This actually returned a zero return code. The lack of output here means that everything passed successfully. So what we can do here is we can pass in this features flag to sort of control some WASM features going on here, as well as revert this back to the original WASM proposal itself from kind of the, uh, the days of yore. So here on route, and we'll probably hello.wasm with the features here. We can see that this is no longer a valid module once we turn off these features. So clearly this module uses some features. Well, I'm curious as to what, so let's try and take a look at this. This is saying this binary offset inside the module, but we don't really know exactly where that is, and so we can use this uh, p or print offsets option of the print subcommand. So we can run wasm tools print dash p of hello.wasm. That produces way too much output, so we'll put it in hello.wet one more time. Take a look at that, and if we look for three, oh, this, well, I'm gonna go back up here, so three E something, all right. So this offset, three E O, is falling in the middle of these two instructions. Now, if you're not familiar with this, this is turning out to be the call indirect instruction actually changed in codings with the reference types proposal. So you can just kind of take me for granted on that and I'm gonna pass in reference types here. 
So we'll see what pops out next. So this is saying there's another function that is failing to validate, but we can see here we've got a nice uh, file name here. We've got a line number here, kind of at the edge with this blown up font and everything. But if we take a look at that, 70C7, we can see sure enough, this is the memory.copy instruction from the bulk memory proposal. So we can kind of do this all one more time, pass in bulk memory. See one more thing at 9B43, and that is another instruction from the sign extension proposal, which was after the original WASM module itself. So we can pass in sign extension, and we can see here, now it has validated successfully, there is no error message, and we're good to go. This is sort of a way you can sort of explore WASM module, see what it's using, or kind of pinpoint what, what, where it's going wrong inside of the module. Now, if I can uh, not actually do weird things in this, the next thing we want to take a look at is I was showing you that if we print this module, it's kind of big. There's a lot of stuff that just flew by there. So if we take a look at the uh, print subcommand again, we can see it's got this skeleton argument, which can kind of help us explore this module at a bit of a higher level. Pass that in here, and we can see that the debug info was replaced by dot, dot, dot. All of these functions are replaced with dot, 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 and we can just sort of scan over and very quickly see what's going on inside of this module. The first thing we'll see, though, is these function names are kind of gobbledygook, not exactly easy to read. This is the mangled form of a function name, as you might expect on native platforms. If we want to get rid of that, well, it turns out there's a subcommand for that as well. We have demangle here. So we run wasm tools demangle of hello.wasm. This is going to try and print a binary file, but I'm on a terminal, so that wouldn't work very well. So I'll request the text format. And again, all this stuff passed, or kind of flew through here. So this shows a next, another feature of WASM tools where we can pipe commands together. So I can take the output of this and pipe that back into print with the skeleton argument. And by not providing an argument here, we can sort of see a chain of commands as we're kind of building up this over time. So we can see here we've got our dot, dot, dots like before. And now we've got these uh, nice demangled function names. They're much prettier. We've got these less thans. It kind of looks a little bit more like native Rust in this regard. Now, so the next thing I want to show you is if we take a look at this actual file itself, that's pretty big. That's a 1.7 megabyte module for Hello World. That's a, a lot larger than kind of the, the very small modules we were just seeing in, in, the, in the embedded talk just before this. So for example, let's try and explore why is this so big. So taking a look at WASM tools, we have this objdump subcommand, which is sort of a poor man's version of the native version of objdump. But what, if we try and run that, uh, pass in objdump with hello.wasm, we can see that it's, it's telling us the sections of this WASM module where they are in the WASM binary, how big they are, and how many items are found inside there. So this, for example, has 181 functions inside this module. So looking at this column over here, we can clearly see that debug info is the problem here. This was I compiled without optimizations. This was not stripped out. So I wonder if we can actually just strip this out. So we have a WASM tools strip subcommand, and this uh, takes a WASM file as input with a couple of various options. But let's just take a look at the stripped output of hello.wasm, and we can do our piping again to take a look at the obj dump of it, and we can see that the data or the uh, the debug info sections are all gone now. We do see that the custom section name is still there, so we can actually request that all custom sections are deleted, and this would actually remove everything. And if we actually take a look at the size of this, that is 54 kilobytes, which is much much smaller than the 1.7 megabytes we started with. We can also do things like we can, uh, if we take a look at this, we can pass a particular regex. So we can say if we only want to delete the debug info sections, we can kind of type out the various syntax for uh, debug info name. We can pipe that back into WASM tools obj dump. And we can see that our custom sections, such as name, producers, and target features were preserved, but the debug info is now all gone. So this is sort of uh, the basics of working with Hello, uh, with, of working with WASM tools. Oh, I get to walk now. So as we saw here, there are many, many subcommands inside of WASM tools. We can explore them with the dash H. We can explore them within each subcommand itself. And all of these subcommands are kind of taking WASM, outputting WASM, and they have the option of either working with text or binary. You can kind of redirect the output to a file, or you get to out and standard out by default. This kind of standard out means that we can pipe these commands together to kind of build up these chains of commands locally, which is kind of useful when you're kind of typing something out and you're just kind of, oh, I want to add this on, I want to add this on, you kind of want to interactively work with whatever WASM module you're working with. As we saw, there's a little bit of color, not a huge amount of color, but the idea is helping make it as easy as possible to understand. So next, now let's work a little bit more with the text format of WebAssembly. We've been seeing a lot of it, but I want to actually show a little bit more. Not quite like that. Whoop, there we go. So uh, we'll come over here to the text format. 
And we have a sample module that I have prepared here. So this is a small module. We got these parentheses. We got uh, some types in here. We're going to just add two numbers and return the result here. So I'll put here that here at the bottom so we can keep it on the screen. And the first things we want to take a look at is converting this to binary. This is where this parse subcommand comes in. So we can run wasm tools parse add.wet and we can put it in add.wasm. So sure enough, that pops out this add.wasm file. We can take a look at it and we can see that it's significantly smaller than the text format. We can validate it and see that it is indeed a valid wasm module. But this brings us to the next aspect of I've been feeding a lot of wasm binaries to these commands, but we can also feed in the text format. All of these commands are intended to be sort of used locally during development to so kind of make it a little bit easier to work with. So this will transparently compile the text to binary and then validate that. This is a bit of a problem though, or let's say if we made a mistake, we try and validate this. This says that the offset OX25 is invalid, but that's in the binary, which doesn't actually translate back to the original text format itself. So to help out with that, we have this idea of generating dwarf. So during the process of compiling from the text format to the binary format, we can generate dwarf debugging information to point back to the text format and see what pops out. So I'm passing the dash G flag here, and we can see that this error message now has a file name, which is our add.wet, and it's got a line number, which is line five. So this is the actual offending instruction here. Uh, this is a bit of a synthesized function name, so we can, for example, put on adder here. We can get that to show up with adder. So it's the same error we were seeing before, but with extra information. This is very helpful for sort of exploring large WASM files or large text files if you make an error somewhere in the middle of it. Now, the next thing I want to show you is uh, another part of the text format called the WAST text format. So we'll quit out of this and we'll take a look at WAST. This is the upstream text format for tests in the spec repositories for WebAssembly. So if you're writing a WASM runtime, if you're writing a tool that processes WASM, you will typically want to run against these tests to try and make sure you can process all of those binaries. This looks very similar, but what we can do here is we can say we want to put various assertions inside here. So if I invoke the add function with i32.const of one and two, then this should produce the result of three. This is the text format where you can just add a bunch of assertions. You can define more modules. You could link things up. But this is sort of kind of, I'm not going to go through all the details here. But if we, uh, for example, pass this to WASM time, which I'm not going to demo too, too much here. This didn't actually do a whole lot because it passed. But for example, if we wrote down the wrong thing, this is going to say we expected four, we got three, but this is a bug in the test. So we'll just go fix that here. So uh, what, what do we actually have in WASM tools for parsing this? We have this JSON from WAST subcommand. So if you run WASM tools JSON from WAST of add.wast, this is going to split it, spit out a blob of JSON. We'll make it a little bit pretty here, prettier here so we can actually see what's going on. And we can see that this is derived from the original add.wast, but chiefly this is actually parsing this all for us. This is in a much easier way for tooling to, to consume. So for example, we have this add.0.wasm, which was printed out here. And if we print that, we can see that we've got our original WASM module. This is what we were actually looking for here. And then if we look elsewhere in the JSON, you can see this assert return with a one, a two, and a three, and all of those various aspects. So this is much easier for tools to parse with just JSON, as opposed to dealing with the entire text format of WebAssembly and the tests themselves. And there's one other small piece before I go along. So I wanted to, to point out, we've got this add.wat. And so this is, if we actually print add.wat, we find something curious, which is the top and the bottom don't look the same. This is showing some of the kind of niceties or sort of the sugar that's in the text format. So for example, this type was implicitly defined by just simply putting the type on the function itself. This export was kind of defined inline here. And we can also go so far as to look at the folded instructions, which that means, so I'll pass this, we can actually render the instructions a little bit differently as well. So we can have a nice add instruction here, which, which uh, is a little bit easier as for us as humans to read because the operation comes first and the arguments come a little bit later. These two modules mean the same thing, but it's kind of depending on how you want to write it, it makes it a little bit nicer to, to, um, to work with these modules depending on what you're actually working on internally. So. Uh, that's sort of kind of the, the summary of working with text in WASM tools is that a lot of these subcommands will transparently take both binary and text. The text format has a lot of sugar associated with it, which makes it a little bit easier to both read and write. We can sort of debug with uh, debugging information and dwarf debugging information to kind of see what's going on internally when these large WAT files if something goes wrong. And I definitely want to give a shout out. This JSON from WAST subcommand is very much inspired by uh, Wabbit's WAST2JSON subcommand. 
And I can definitely give a shout out that dash F folder arguments, Keith over here actually implemented that in Wasm tools recently. So many thanks to Keith for implementing all that. So this is sort of the basics of working with text and working with uh, both in the, the Wasm text form, with the Wasm binary format or in Wasm tools itself. So now I wanna show you one of my favorite topics, which is testing WebAssembly. So let's say you are writing a, ra a, a runtime again. I realize not necessarily everyone is doing this, but I'm a little biased, but you're writing a, you're writing a runtime. You wanna write some test cases. You wanna generate some Wasm modules to actually run against your runtime. If we take a look at Wasm tools, it has this Smith subcommand, which is helpfully entitled a Wasm test case generator. So if we take a look at Smith, this has quite a few options associated with it. There's all sorts of ways that we can control and customize the output of the actual module itself. But what we're most interested in here is this seed. This seed is a suite or just kind of some random input. And the idea is that this will deterministically be used to generate a WASM module. So let's try and just run that. So we run, well, not WASM time, but WASM tools. Smith, I'm just gonna feed it some random module, some random data here. So I'll just take two kilobytes from dev urandom. If I can type you random, I have a terrible time doing that. We're gonna print the binary format, but on a terminal, we wanna see text. So I'm just gonna keep running this and we can see that every time we're generating a completely different WASM module every single time. The interesting part here is that if we try and validate all of this, pipe it into WASM tools, validate, all of these are valid WASM modules. So all of these are different, but specifically valid WASM modules. And that's sort of the nice uh, property of these generated modules. So we can sort of customize this as well. Let's say we want, uh, let's say one type and let's say five functions. As we run this, we're gonna get different functions every single time, but we're always going to have at least one type and at least five functions. We can then customize this a little bit. Let's kind of run this a little bit. Oh yeah, there we go. We got a SIMD instruction here, but I don't wanna actually use SIMD, so I'm gonna turn off SIMD. Oh, if I can spell the word false. And then we, we come up here, we got, uh, we got some tail calls, but I don't want tail calls, so let's turn that off. So this is showing how we have a lot of control over the various options here. We now see, for example, a GC proposal. So we can turn that off. We can say GC enabled is false. If I, again, if I can type false. So we have this, all these ways to control how this module is generated. We can also do things such as we can uh, limit the entire classes of instructions to, for example, just numeric instructions. This means the functions generated are just straight line code, lots of numerics. They're just kind of generating random values, but there's no memory here, there's no control flow, but we can add in control flow. And this will add in blocks, and we got some exception handling tables, we got some loops. This is sort of all, again, random modules being generated here. One of the most interesting things I wanna show you as well is also the idea of allow invalid funks. I wanna turn that on. So I was showing that Wasm Tools Smith is always generating a valid module, but what this is doing is it's taking random data in the input and just putting it in the output function. Now, naturally here, we can't even print this because this is no longer a valid Wasm module, but this is very useful for testing both the, the happy path of a valid module and also the invalid path of a completely random module. So let's actually take this, I'm not gonna do the text format here because we wanna output binary, and let's put this in out.wasm. If we try and validate this, this is probably not gonna validate. This is a type error, and that's as expected, we just kind of put random data inside of a function. The problem though is I wanted to explore this a little bit. So let's uh, take this uh, 757, so we'll print uh, dash p out.wasm, but everything is truncated here. This actually didn't get very far. This actually didn't get into the modules because this is specifically invalid. So this brings us to another subcommand inside of Wasm tools called dump, where this is sort of a low level inspection of what's going on inside of a Wasm module. So we can run Wasm tools dump over out.wasm. That generates a fair amount of output. So let's put it out in out.dump. Let's take a look at out.dump. And then, then if we look for our 757, oh, I can't type five apparently. We can see here that this function starts with this i32.exe instruction. But that is not valid wasm. This actually needed some inputs. And again, this is just random data as inputs, but we can see that, for example, this is just an invalid opcode. This was just happened to be i32.reinterpret f32, and this just happened to be a local set for a local 20. So we can sort of use this allow invalid funks to sort of explore the invalid cases, and we can also use this dump subcommand to kind of take a look at the actual wasm modules themselves. The next thing I want to show you is the next thing related to testing, which is mutation. This is a wasm test case mutator. Now, if we take a look at that, we can see that it also takes an input. So let's just pass that back in. Let's, uh, from the text, we'll do add.wasm and we'll just mutate this and get the text. So we can see here, this looks like our add module from before, but this function type is brand new. 
if I keep running this, it's actually gonna keep generating the same module, and that's because it's using the exact same seed. This is just like Wasm Smith, where the same transformation is always being done, so you have to pass in a random seed to get something else. So I'll pass in a random number. And we can see now we got a custom section. This time, nothing was applicable. This time, oh, what did happen? Oh, we replaced a local with a constant zero. This time, I don't actually know what got mutated. But in any case, every time we run this, we're gonna get slightly different mutations. Now you might be asking yourself, why is this useful? Starting from an interesting test case and then kind of mutating it a little bit further. To, to, to motivate this, I wanna show a bit of a case study. So I have here a pretty old version of Wasm Time. This is about two years old at this point. I also have this test case where if I run Wasm Time, we needed, we needed a feature at the time, so Wasm Features Memory 64, which I have a tough time typing. This is a bug inside of Wasm Time. This is a panic. This is a panic inside of Wasm Time's code generator. So this was a bug that was found by Wasm Tools Smith, and now we want to see what is this bug actually. So let's take a look at it. Take a look at test case 0.wasm. That was a big module. We got a lot of functions here. We got a lot of SIMD here. We got a lot of big functions here. We got a whole lot of functions here. We have no idea where this bug is. This is a very large test case. We take a look at this, and this is three and a half, three and a half kilobytes. So this Wasm Tools shrink subcommand, if we take a look at it, is specifically trying to preserve a property of interest about a Wasm module, such as in our case, triggering a compiler bug. This takes a predicate, which is a command, which I have already written out here, where it's going to be the exact same invocation we saw previously with the Wasm time and the necessary flags. This is the input to the script, and we're just going to look for the word panic. That's kind of, we just want to, we want to panic here, we want to kind of see how far this goes. So we can run Wasm tools shrink over test.sh with test case 0.wasm, and we are off to the races. Internally, what's happening here is this is actually running Wasm tools mutate and making a small adjustment to the module every single time. It's then running our script to see, is this still interesting? And if so, it's keeping it if it's smaller. So we're iteratively shrinking this internally here, and we can see that each shrunk version is outputting the smallest version at the end. So if we take a look at uh, the, te the text format here, we can see we've got a bunch of exports here, but we're already down to almost one function. We already removed most functions in the module. And so the shrinking process is probably figuring out that we don't actually need most of these exports. We probably don't actually need this function at the end with just an unreachable. So if we take a look one more time, we can see all those exports are gone and the second function is also gone. I know that from running this a few times that 136 bytes, this is the end of Wasm Tools Shrink. This is the shrunk down version, which is much more digestible, much easier to work with. And so we have a much smaller test case here. We can also even see that after this BR table, all of these functions are actually dead, dead code. So we can actually manually run this a little bit more. But so that's sort of the overall of testing in Wasm Tools. The high level idea here is we can run the Smith subcommand to generate random modules. We have all sorts of knobs to control how this module looks, depending on which runtime you're running against or kind of what you want to be testing. And we can also mutate these modules, make them a little bit more interesting in a slightly different way, and then shrink them if they're a little bit too big to kind of debug to kind of see what's going on. So this brings us to the final demo I'd like to do of components. I do a lot of stuff with components, so I can't do anything without actually talking about components. So we have here a simple component. This is again the text format, but for components. We can see this is very similar to the core module text format. So we got these parentheses, we got this component container, and this is our add module from before. The, di the difference here is we have this instantiate where we can instantiate our core WASM module, and this lift where we're taking the original uh, core WASM and kind of putting it in the component model type system. So I'll put this down here on the bottom so we can still have that. Uh, one of the nice parts about Wasm Tools is we can actually pass in not only the text format to all of these top-level subcommands, but also components. They all transparently work with both components and modules and either the binary or the text format. So we can validate it, we can print it, we can, uh, we can actually look at validation, and then if we turn on, I think, uh, component model, no, we want component model. So if we turn off the component model feature, Oh, I'm dealing with various shell parsing issues, but this is an error saying if you don't actually turn on the component model, you can't actually validate the component model. So what's going on here is uh, this is all kind of the same things we were seeing internally, but we also have uh, this component subcommand. So we take a look at that. We can see there's a couple of new subcommands we haven't seen before, but specifically centered around components, primarily this wit embedding and new, which is creating a component. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna run wasm tools component wit over this component. 
Now we can see this is the interface. This is the wit IDL specific to components, which is the type of this component. So it exports a single function called add. We can actually come in here. We can change the S32 to U32. Run the component wit command again, and we can see that we've changed the type of this component as it looks like to the outside world. What I want to do here, though, is I want to take this, put it in component.wit. I want to take this module, and I want to put it in module.wet. Oh, I'm really having a really hard time typing today, or spelling. I'm never really that good at spelling. All right, so now we have our component.wit and our module.wet. And what I want to do now is go backwards. I want to go back to the component. So for that, we're going to use the component embed so command to start off with, where this takes first a wit and then a wasm. So we run component.wit and module.wet. We'll take a look at the text format again, and we can see this is our module as input, but we've added this custom section. This is sort of the extra piece of type metadata which we're using to actually create the component. This is called the component type, and we can see a little bit of what's going on here, but this is mostly binary. So we can start using the piping again. So we can pipe in, pipe this into Wasm Tools component new. We want to take a look at the text format of that, and voila, we have our component back out the other side. This, however, is starting from the core Wasm module, coming back out to a component. So we can see here that custom section for the type metadata is gone. We have our producer sections, though, for just sort of tooling going on here. We can also see some, uh, the component originally didn't actually mention this type, or it didn't mention this alias. Again, we could have some sugar in the component text format, as opposed to internally. So the next thing, I, we can actually keep on piping this. We can pipe this into Wasm Tools component wit again, get the wit back out. But wit can also actually be viewed as text format as well. So this is the wit document being rendered as wasm in the wasm type or the wasm component model format. This specifically is using the type section and is a way that we can distribute wit documents both as wasm text or wasm binary. So we can emit wasm here, but I'll have to actually print that so I can print this here and it's the same thing we were just taking a look at. And we can of course continue to pipe all this along again. So wasm tools component wit. One more time, and we can just kind of keep getting the same wit document out. This is again the kind of piping along and kind of building up these commands as we go along. So all right, that's all we've got for components for now. The general idea being that we have a lot of support in the top level commands for both components and modules. The sort of creation of components is done through these sort of low level embedding and new subcommands, not necessarily on the CLI. For, uh, in a sense, I'll talk about the libraries in just a moment. And then wit is a central part of the component model tooling right now which deals with both the many formats of wit. We can kind of desugar wit, take a look at the wasm form, distribute that, work with all the kind of Swiss army knife of the wit subcommand. Now, I've, I was saying at the very beginning that the uh, wasm tools project also has all these crates. So this is where all of these subcommands that we've been taking a look at are also part of crates that are in this repository. So if you're writing a Rust project, you can very easily pull these off of crates.io and use them internally. Either if you want to parse or print or te parse text or generate tests, this is particularly useful, for example, in fuzzing, where you don't necessarily want to spawn a process. You want to just actually generate a module internally right then and there. Now, I've got one more demo, because it's always fun whenever you have uh, anything uh, working with Wasm. So we can actually compile Wasm tools to Wasm. So I can take a look at this, and I can run Wasm tools, and I can validate it against wasmtools.wasm. And sure enough, it is indeed valid, but we can go one step further. We can run Wasm time. We're going to give it access to files. Wasm tools .wasm validating. Oh, if I could type validating, Wasm tools .wasm. So this is Wasm time running Wasm tools compiled to Wasm validating Wasm tools .wasm, and we get access to all the other fun stuff. Like we can print it out, get a whole bunch of stuff. We can dump it out. We can kind of do whatever we want there. Basically, it's just kind of a fun demo of you can actually compile all this, run it on the web. We have a bit of a web demo for a few of these subcommands, but not necessarily all of them. And it's always just kind of fun to compile things to Wasm. So all right, that's what I have for now. Uh, again, this is a open source project in the Bytecode Alliance. We're always welcome to many contributions, whether you want a new subcommand, a bug in a subcommand, a, a flag in a subcommand, or anything you would find useful in debugging a WASM module and experience. I'm also happy to answer any questions about any of these topics here. And yes, thank you for coming. All right, any questions? Sure.
Sure. So do you mean like uh, mapping sort of this binary form of a WIT document or the WASM form of a WIT document kind of back to the core WASM module itself? I see. So like, what is this zero here? Yeah, okay. So this is where uh, the component model text format has quite a lot of indices, just like the core WASM text format. And what I might recommend is, I didn't actually go over this, but we have a name unnamed flag in this, and we'll see that this uh, spits out, for example, this is type zero, and that corresponds to this type zero up here. So if you're ever curious about uh, indices, that's a great way to do it, and you can kind of, kind of explore this. This also makes it much easier to edit because you can move things around. You don't have to worry about type indices because it's all got names. So uh, not exactly going to answer your question, but this is uh, at least that zero was a type, and kind of you can explore from there. Perfect. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to give you all a WASM module, and you have to. I'm going to expect a quiz due by tomorrow of what that WASM module is. Thank you for coming.